Coming in mid-2020 from Death's Head Press is an anthology more than 30 years in the making. I am, of course, talking about Pulling Your Strings, a tribute to King Diamond, which celebrates the contributions of King Diamond to not only the heavy metal scene, but also to the horror genre as a whole. Featuring such authors as Rachel Autumn Deering, Matt Hayward, Ryan Harding, Armand Rosamilia, and Morgan Sylvia, all together to honor King Diamond. If you want to keep up on this release, go to deathsheadpress.com. That's deathsheadpress.com. Or follow them on Twitter at Death's Head Press. This week's show is also brought to you by our good friends at adamandeve.com, America's number one trusted source for all things in the bedroom. They have things for her, things for him, things for both of you. Be sure to use that offer code at checkout. What is that offer code once again? Why, it's Keen, K-E-E-N-E. Put it in at checkout and you will receive 10 free tantalizing gifts as well as discreet shipping. That's adamandeve.com, offer code KEEN. No comment! Sir, what about the ending to The Rising? Mother f***! What part of no comment don't you understand? Do you understand this? This interview is over! No comment! The f***! Brian Keen was also unavailable for comment. Welcome back once again to The Horror Show with Brian Keene, brought to you by the Project Entertainment Network, available for free on iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher, iHeartRadio, YouTube, and all other platforms. I am your host, Brian Keene. I have lost my voice. We'll get to why in just a moment. Joining me as always, let's start to my immediate left, Professor Mary San Giovanni. Hi there. Uh, adjunct Professor Matt Wilderson. Hey, everybody. Uh... Professor Emeritus, is that, did I Emeritus. pronounce that right? Emeritus? <laughs> John Urbanson. <laughs> Greetings. <laughs> Professor Veronica. <laughs> Professor Veronica. That's me. Oh, and my. The, the university's janitor, Mr. Dave yeah. Thomas. What? <laughs> <laughs> what? Oh, sorry, I'm imitating what's it like to ride around in an Uber when they won't turn their fucking radio down. <laughs> Jesus. Seriously, Com- dudes. Coming up later in the show, we have... Uh, one of my favorite interviews of the year. And we've had some great interviews this year. But this is one of my favorites. We have uh, filmmaker Hansi Oppenheimer, along with not just one Lansdale, but the entire Lansdale family. A we bouquet have, of Lansdales. Yes, we have, we have a bouquet <laughs> of Lansdales. And we, we have, of course, his own self, <laughs> Joe R. Lansdale. Uh, we have our dear friend Casey Lansdale. Uh, we have screenwriter Keith Lansdale. And we have what I think is the most powerful member of the Lansdale clan, and that is, of course, Karen Lansdale, who I don't, I don't think Karen does a lot of interviews. No. I don't think um, so. No. So I was super excited to have her on a microphone. So, and you will find out why. So that's coming up. Now, as always, uh, the caveat, they were not here in studio with us. That was recorded at a convention. Uh, so the sound quality is going to be a little different than what you're used to on this show. Uh, don't blame Dave. Don't oh, no, no, blame, blame me, because everything... Oh, yeah, yeah. okay, yeah, blame Dave, yeah. blame Dave. Don't I was going to have everybody blame Matt, but... No, okay. no, don't blame Matt. He's uh-huh. uh, he's you know working in the kitchen and mad at the world. So. Matt, does it feel weird to you that you were just in this studio three days ago? It doesn't feel like three days ago. It doesn't feel like three days ago? No. Yeah, we should probably, we should recap, um, because, you know, there we have a lot, we have a very large listening audience, and... I'm very aware that not all of you follow us on social media. <gasps> and this is going to be one of those times that bites you in the ass. Uh, <laughs> we have, of course, you know, <laughs> back in 2017, we did a we did a 24-hour charity telethon 
In 24 hours, we raised more than $10,000 for the Scares the Care charity. Last year, we did a second telethon. In 24 hours, we raised more than $20,000 for Scares the Care. Now, we were going to do a third one this year. Um, we had talked about it. We were going to go out to Dark Delicacies in Burbank. Of course, Dave, then your, your doctor told you you couldn't travel, so we canceled it. Um, Asshole. But then, <laughs> last Saturday... I was sitting here reading an Iron Man comic, Mary, was I not? Iron Man issue 106, in which Tony wants to retire, doesn't want to be Iron Man, (laughs) but they make him come back to help his friends. You're looking at me like this is the first time you told this to me. (laughs) But but those of us who don't follow, those listeners who don't follow us on social media are going to find that they're going to be pissed off here in a moment. Yeah. And I want to explain to them what happened. Uh, anyway, I'm reading this comic <laughs> book, and I decide, you know what? Fuck it. We're going to do a telethon after all. So we did it the next day. We did it last Sunday. Uh, we called it the almost but not quite third annual telethon because it was very impromptu. Yes. Uh, but, yeah, Matt, you showed up. Mary, you were here. John, you were here. Um, and, and I want to give shout-outs to the folks who just last minute jumped in and helped us. Uh, Wesley Southerd. Chris Enterline, Robert Ford, and Kelly Owen all made the actual trek here. And then uh, Chris Nobody Bolton. else. Do what? And nobody else. Nobody else. Everybody else is on the list. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Christopher <laughs> Golden, John Langan, Jeff Strand, Bracken McLeod, Maurice Broadus. Who else am I missing? Um, there were other people that called. Stephen Kosanowski. Yeah, Kosanowski. Yeah. Um, Shit, son of a bitch. Who else am I missing? Let's go to BrianKeen.com real quick and find out. Is that um, like, let's go to the videotape? This is while Brian is Here looking stuff up. Here we go. Here we go. <laughs> okay. In order. Just thank everybody in order. Paul Tremblay, Kelly Owen, Christopher Golden, Mary San Giovanni, Maurice Broadus, Bracken McLeod, Jeff Strand, John Langan, Wesley Southard, Stephen Kozanowski, John Urbansick, Matt Wildeson, Robert Ford, and Chris Enterline. And then also, people didn't realize it, but in the in the YouTube chat, we had Tim Levin, Jay Wilburn, and Wiley Young keeping people. They were doing like their own sub- <laughs> telethon in the chat yeah it's actually pretty amazing yeah to watch. They, they did an awesome job keeping everybody entertained in yeah. there um so what we did is is we we promoted four gofundmes of course dave's um author jim moore editor jack herringa and comic book retailer bill wall so you might have missed that if you weren't on social media but guess what you didn't miss it unlike previous telethons you can go back and listen to to the entire show yeah. in its entirety. It's archived on my YouTube channel. Uh, it's there right now for you to listen to. So go do that when, when you have uh, 12 hours to spare. Yeah, it might take you a while. <laughs> if you're going on a really long road trip. Yeah. And, and we should mention, all four of those GoFundMes are still live. So if you're just now finding out about this and you're like, well, I would have given money if I'd known about it. Well, guess what? You still can. Um, go to GoFundMe and you can type each of their names in the search bar and they will pop up or you can go to briankeen.com all the gofundmes are direct linked there also scares the care.org has them all direct linked as well yep. um now dave what was that like for you listening to a telethon taking place and you weren't involved this time was um, that weird no no it wasn't weird because the only weird thing was is is i didn't realize you had talked we had talked about this last week and you're like oh in october i might do this and then I, I'm, you know, at Prague Power, and I see you on Twitter, <laughs> and he's like, fuck it, I'm doing it tomorrow. And I'm like, uh-oh. <laughs> uh-oh. Somebody was on the phone with Golden today. <laughs> and that's exactly, yeah. that's exactly yeah. I read the comic, yeah. I handed it to Mary, I called Chris, Mary's I, flipping through it, and she looks at me, yeah. and she's yeah. like, you're going to do a telethon yeah. at the same time I'm telling Golden, fuck mm-hmm. it, I'm going to do a yeah, telethon. Exactly. I could see the, I could see the right. little twinkle in his eye. So, I know what the twinkle means. So uh, I, I, there was a little confusion on my end, but it was all my fault. Uh, so no, I I obviously couldn't listen to it until I got home because uh, I wasn't paying for Wi-Fi on the plane because fuck that. Um, so I, I listened to it in the car on the way home. And I listened to a good chunk of it. I, it, I lasted till about four thirty, and I fell asleep um, and missed the end of it. So, uh, but no, it was entertaining. I I have to say, um, Wesley Southern talking about books, right? Well, seriously, why does he do that more often? Uh, he's exactly. like the, he's like the new Hayes. I mean, not, you know, like he's. That was the most interesting. Like he's been on our show and other shows. 
He needs to just like maybe have his own podcast where he talks about book collecting. Because re- re- reminded Mary and yeah. I very much of very Hazel's. much yeah, Hazel's. Abso- yeah, absolutely. No, he was great. I mean, everybody was good that was on the show. You know, the parts I saw or listened to. Um, but you know, again, thank I cannot thank you enough personally, you Brian. You you know, you said during the show, you know, I I don't even know what to say to you. Just thank you. Um, I really appreciate. It. I appreciate all the people you know helping out and donating and to me and the other people. Um, as I discovered yesterday, um, not 100% sure yet, but it sounds like my plan is going to be six weeks of chemotherapy and radiation right. followed by surgery. The radiation is five days a week. So I will be at the hospital every day of the week for six weeks. Well, that's going to be fun. No, it's not. It's going <laughs> to suck. You know why? Because That's after, not how fun works. After about two weeks, I'm probably going to start getting sick. So now, according to the doctor... I can drive myself back and forth to treatment, which is really good because that means Phoebe doesn't have to take off work. Are you but, worried at all about chemo brain in driving? N- I, I don't know what's going to happen to me yet. So we're just going to have to wait and see. Uh, if not, then I'm going to make an alternate arrangement. There's a, a charity whose name escapes me at the moment that drives people yes, to yeah. appointments like this mm-hmm. for little to no cost. Yeah, it's the yeah. Mike Lombardo charity. <laughs> we, we just have Lombardo. <laughs> what's he doing during the day? Not, we, making pizzas. <laughs> That's what he's always doing, you know. Not that's making, important work. Not making movies like I'm always. <laughs> I'm always finding good things on 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 you know in the news. There was a guy who was arrested and in his car. He had a open bottle of liquor, a rattlesnake, a gun, and a container of uranium. And I'm like Lombardo. Oh this my is god! Your, this is your next movie right here. Start making this immediately. You know, that's Saturday night. It was. A, I was reading this article there. This is the greatest article ever because the cop was like, "I've never found this in a car before." <laughs> You know, if you, if you did, yeah. that would be a problem. Wait, wait, is any of that illegal to carry? No, just wait. The <laughs> uranium definitely no, wait, is. No, he had a legal amount of uranium. Like, how the fuck is there a legal amount of uranium? Well, like, this should be not existing. Yeah. Wait, wait, wait. wait. Yeah. But, the, like, a minuscule amount of uranium can cause a massive explosion. So yeah. what is the legal I amount of uranium? And the other thing was, is it was Oklahoma. <laughs> Brian's like, looking it up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. no, I already know what the answer is. Uh, I'm just uh, waiting for a break. So this, oh, so, so the other thing is that you know, the guy had a rattlesnake in the car, and they're like, we can't charge this because certain times of year you're allowed to hunt rattlesnakes. I'm like, that's fine. Hunt rattlesnakes. Not put them in the backseat of your car. You can't like, put them live out. in yeah. your car to, what, <laughs> drink your booze and, I, and yeah, tap knows? into your uranium? What if it was yeah. his pet, his partner, his what lover? What if it became a radioactive he, super snake because it tapped the into the uranium? That's what he's trying to do. He's trying to make a super snake. Oh, my God. <laughs> I'm oh trying to see, see, this, see that's I, comic book script, logic. Doesn't work that way in real life. The writes planet is doomed. Quit screwing around in the pizza place and start making. <laughs> I, yeah. I don't know what the legal. Yeah, I know that I have 1.5 kilograms in dispersible form, and that's the maximum I can have in dispersible form. Now the internet tells. <laughs> There you go, Mary. You just found an Easter egg hunt. Wow! <laughs> the, the internet tells me you, you can't have more than seven kilograms. I was always told I couldn't have more than one point five. Yeah, I, um, I, it's dispersible, baby. It's not like you're gonna accidentally put it in your in your. I don't know what any of this means. Mary, remember, that's just the uranium. Ask him how much plutonium he's got. (laughs) I don't anymore. I sold all the plutonium when royalties were were drying up last Oh, my God. Now you know why your tomato plants went fucking crazy. I I I, I, yes. I made salsa from those tomatoes. Good God, what's going to happen to us? You haven't been eating those, have you? Oh, no, hell no. You You haven't noticed that? that's why he gave tomatoes to everybody. You know, Yeah, that's why he gave me tomatoes. I come back, I have a Joe R. Lansdale tomato story that i want to tell okay but when we get back around to talking right. about lansdale but uh <laughs> so yeah i just again thank you seriously you are one of the few people in my life that i actually like and trust well and and you're like a brother to me and i've never had a family so like Aww. you and the rest of these nit- nitwits and you know some of the other ones in the area not necessarily kosniewski um <laughs> you know you, you guys are my family this is this and the prog power people um so and I, I was at Prog Power this last weekend, and uh, yeah, how? I mean, because Prog Power, you got to stand. How did no, you do? No, no, there's seats. Oh, you got seats. No, there's they have it's it's standing on the floor, and then it's a, a like a half semicircle, and it's all seated. Right. So uh, we have sat in the exact same spot behind the soundboard for the last uh, eighteen years. Were you able to maneuver through the crowd? Uh, I basically I go and I sit down. And I don't move. 
except yeah. to go to the bathroom or to go get a bottle of water because I wasn't drinking all weekend. Do you just like pee in the empty water bottle? Then? No, I actually no. go to the bathroom. I'm not like a barbarian. Um, you know, <laughs> it's not. So, I feel like you gotta. It's not like he's a senator of filibuster. Get a <laughs> more stuff, dude. If, if I had cancer, I'd pee in the Gatorade bottle at the concert. Fuck you! I have cancer. I can do. This. I know you have this thing about peeing on everything on Earth. I, I know and, and on other planets. This yes. is not my fetish. <laughs> you know? I, I just use the toilet. It's okay. You but, with the pee and the uranium. Yeah. It's like you're like someone I don't even know anymore. In all, in all seriousness, because um, I go with my ex-wife, Mary, who, again, full financial disclosure, I do not pay to go to Prog Power. Do right. not think any GoFundMe yeah, money yeah. went to go Prog Power. That's she pays for this. Yes. I don't spend any money on anything. I have no money. So, but... Through and it's not a divorce agreement that we go to this, and there's only five left after this year. So. Wait, wait, you actually have it in the divorce? She put it in there. That- she put it in there. Aww. Yeah. yeah. And she said, man, she, yeah. When she went to the lawyer, the lawyer's like, what the hell is this? And she, and she explained to him what it was. No, it's, it was her idea. And That's I'm like, amazing. That's kind of an awesome clause no, right there. Yeah, you know, it was just that as long as it, that it exists, we will go every year, and, and she's going to take care of it. So, anyway, um, for example, you know, we left out of Baltimore and we fly to Atlanta. Uh, if you've ever been to Atlanta, it's it's insane. It's the biggest, it's the craziest airport in the world. Um, and she's like, you're going to get a wheelchair. And I'm like, I, I don't like to be a wheelchair. But honest to God, she was right because the walk in Atlanta is 35,000 miles from where you land to where you get. Yeah, and, yeah. And we, so, and we, so and we you see parts of the airport you've never yeah, seen Yeah, it's before. ridiculous. Mm-hmm. So these people that push wheelchairs to the airport are the most amazing people I've ever seen in my life. Because <laughs> no lie, this one woman was pushing two of us at the same time and we get to like a security line and she just flips around backwards and drags the other one forward and it's like I, I'm like stunned at this. if I tried to do this I would die you know so but we did that and then uh, we stayed in an Airbnb this year which I this is the first time I ever used Airbnb I cannot recommend this service enough it I've heard good things half the price of a hotel and it was wow. a delightful condo it was super nice um, you know all the TVs had Roku boxes on them it was it was great and, and it was Really close to the venue. It was only like maybe two blocks. Uh, we did take an Uber, though, because the, the, Atlanta is construction central. It's like Pennsylvania. So all the sidewalks are torn up. So I wasn't going to walk because I had my cane. And, um, you know, I just went I sat in my seat and just enjoyed the music. And uh, a lot of people came over to talk to me, obviously, that have known me for many, many years. Like I said, this is the 20th one. So, so there's, there are people there like me who have been to, like, I've been to 19 out of the 20, but there's, you know, some people have been this way. But anyways, a lot of people going. So uh, her and my friend Kelly Elder, uh, like, were helping me all weekend, you know. The the bad thing about the place is the stairs. I don't know who built this place. They were obviously drunk because the stairs are all different sizes. So there's, like, Escher stairs? Yeah, exactly. It's like, <laughs> you know, they're death stairs because I've fallen down them many times. Oh, So many drunk people. So, uh, but I have to say, people who are jackasses and won't get out of your way on stairs when you have a cane, are, I, I need to kill them. So I almost beat somebody to death. That and the two girls that tried to jump in front of me at the bar line because they wanted their alcohol. And I'm like, I don't think so. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, nope, behind me. <laughs> and the, the bar, t- the one bartender, she, again, she's been there forever, so she knows me. She's like, no, 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 you, he was next. You know, she's like yelling at him. So, but uh, well, we're had glad, a great time. We're glad I had you had fun. Caligula's dude. horse shirt on today because Caligula horse played one of my favorite bands from Australia. Um, so no, it was great. I, I went. I could not have done it without Mary. There's absolutely no way I could have gone by myself. Um, and that's pretty much the end of my fun for a while. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, well, it's, it's, I don't know when this treatment's going to start, but it's going to be soon. That's that's what we know right now. I've, and that's to shrink the tumor. I, the, the theory is, and again, I have a huge test tomorrow that will determine more of this. The theory is to shrink the tumor down through this radiation and, and, and chemotherapy. And then a couple weeks after that, do surgery to get rid of what's left. Gotcha. That is the theory. We will see well, if that holds true. Now, I talked to, uh, to Jim Moore the day before the telethon. Um, they thought he was going to be done with chemo, and then he would get radiation. Mm-hmm. Uh, what they're finding out now is he's actually going to still have to do chemo while he's getting radiation. Yeah, there is, they told me that, that I'm, chemo's one day a week, radiation's five. So one of those days a week, uh, I, I will get both treatments, and I will be at the hospital most of the day. The other days, it only takes about an hour yeah. for the radiation, so it's, it's quick. Um, so why I see that yeah. Matt is prepared in your absence, you, 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 yes. you're drinking out of a 55 gallon drum. What is that? I've I did never s- seen a water bottle like that. <laughs> it's not, not water. A water bottle. It's vodka. Fact, yeah, I, it's a water I need, bottle. A, I need a picture of you with that for the for the YouTube channel. It's a uranium container. Um, that's what that it is. is. It's is a uranium <laughs> container, and I'll bet you that's more than seven grams. Yeah. Let's see. <laughs> yeah, that's that's his special. Yeah, you could fill that with pee. 
<laughs> no, if no, you not feel everything like you is a receptacle for pee. To. I, <laughs> again, he's obsessed with the pee and all stuff. I'd rather go not in a on toilet. Our, other places. But, yeah. Wait, <laughs> now I understand why your toilet is iridescent. <laughs> is it? <laughs> we don't have the uranium in the house, do we? We, we like don't, where no. our where our cats are and, and our, our 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 children come and no, such. No, of course not. Oh. That's not very convincing. I'm responsible. It's for science. It's it's, it's oh under God. it's under your chair. It's in, it's in Dr. Yeah. Master's little science kit. Oh God. <laughs> All right. Getting back to the telethon. So so, John, you have participated in the telethons before. I um, in one of them, yes. Yeah, and Mary, of course, you have as well. But this was Matt's first experience. Yep. So, so what did what did you think going home when you got home and your wife said, "What did you do today?" Well, she knew what I was doing. Yeah. Um, on my drive home, I just kind of was like, the day disappeared. Mm-hmm. Like I, I, I knew it was going to be long and arduous, and uh, by the end of it, I was just going to want to sleep. But I couldn't because I had to help babysit two rambunctious kids when i got home right. too <laughs> so i didn't get to bed till like one in the morning that oh night. my god oh. yeah but uh i had a ton of fun yeah. honestly like uh it would have might have been better to wait till october because it would have been not as hot in the room but you know when you get the twinkle in your eye you get yeah. it so it's just gonna right. happen when you want it to it's happen the, well, super here. The, the real secret is i wanted to launch the telethon on the day your new book launched um, that's something else you may. First of all, if you missed the telethon, and again, you didn't actually miss it because all twelve hours of it are on YouTube. Yeah. But you you finally missed Chris Enterline agreeing to come on and be. Yes. Uh, we got. Yeah, that was the first ever. Right. Um, I thought I got it with the portable, but it sounds terrible on my portable. I guess I I placed it wrong. Yeah. Uh, but we got that. And it's on YouTube, <laughs> so folks can go YouTube. listen there. there. Yeah. Um. But yeah, Matt's brand new book. I'm holding it up right now. Horrors Untold by Ooh. Matt Wilson available. I didn't realize the book came out that day. That explains things. Yeah. So it's <laughs> like available on Amazon here. now, right, Matt? Yeah, it it actually came out on like August 20th, but... Well, wait a minute. <laughs> <laughs> we just screw that up. We I mean, I said it a couple times, but... the are shot now. <laughs> We don't understand anything anymore. I was bored and decided to do this. That's, that's <laughs> no, it was So, but yeah, that's out now. That um, is out now, yes. If, if you watch the the live stream from the telethon, uh, you can see us holding the book. I just realized I was holding it up to the microphone now. <laughs> Wait no, this is this is a podcast. This is audio. It's a good audio so, yeah, representation. Before they come on the podcast, yeah. Um, yeah. But I want you to know I started reading it. Um, I know all this stuff is online, but since yeah. I don't have Facebook anymore. I can't read. Yeah, it yeah, yeah. lucky, lucky. But uh, you know, my blood pressure was actually doing better, not being on. Facebook. Oh, I'm sure. Yeah. yeah. Now, quite frankly, the telethon fucked it up. Well, yeah. Uh, to the point where Dungeon Master's mom yesterday, we were supposed to go to a PTO meeting. Mm-hmm. She made me go home. Because she thought I looked dizzy. And then I got home and Mary commented that I looked dizzy. And I swore I wasn't dizzy. And then I went in the bathroom and knocked over a candle holder. And there was broken glass everywhere. But that's not because I was dizzy. That's because the wall moved. Exactly. Oh. So oh. It's kind of like my house where the stairs moved. Oh, yeah. you yeah. guys have those autonomous walls. <laughs> we, oh, okay. we have non-Euclidean was walls. Was that in the rent agreement? Those are my favorite, <laughs> kind, those are my favorite <laughs> kinds of houses. I love, the, I the love non-Euclidean geometry. Realize, you think, oh, it's easy. You're sitting and talking <laughs> for 12 hours. 20 hours. No, it is not. No. That shit is worse than running a marathon. Oh, absolutely. And I've run marathons in my life. Yeah, so, it's, no, it's, it's a is, huge no. mental tax, too, because you think like, oh, well, they got all the people coming over. They'll, they'll never run out of stuff to talk about. No. You're sitting constantly racking your brain how to not have dead air. Right, no. right. Exactly. And, and, and to be interesting <laughs> while you're talking, you know, because yeah. you could just sit there and ramble about like, I don't know, nuts and bolts toadstools. and stuff. and Toadstools. But <laughs> you want to be interesting. <laughs> I did. I rewarded myself Monday night, though. Um, I and, and Mary and John know about this already. Joe Lansdale, who we're going to hear from here in just a moment. Hello to all his fans who are who are fast forward know, right? through all what this. What is to him. this nonsense? Um, he was in town. He and his brother John, who uh, you know, an accomplished Western writer. I think uh, that's something. You know, people say, "Oh, look at the talent in the Lansdale family." You know, Joe's writing, Casey's singing and writing, Keith's writing screenplays, making movies. His brother is a writer as well, so. They were out here, uh, his brother was turning 84, I believe, and they wanted to see Gettysburg. So while they were in town, uh, Chet Williamson and I got together with dinner, for dinner with them, 
and uh, I didn't fanboy. I, I'm finally I finally reached the point where I, <laughs> I don't fanboy anymore. But it was it was interesting. In you know we're just we're talking about books, and of course Joe and Chet they like to tell me stories of of their day because I eat that shit up. Um, you know, so <laughs> I heard I heard some news stories. Uh, I I heard one I'd never heard before about Richard Lehman getting so drunk at a convention they went out they all went out to eat and <laughs> dick got hammered well there's a surprise john right you you knew dick lame as long as i did dick got drunk what? no, no. Way. <laughs> but uh apparently i've heard they, this story before had but you it was, heard it, I, but no no oh. it was only monday night okay yeah <laughs> so dick returned you know they all get back to the hotel and dick's not with them and you know Anne is pretty worried about him and lansdale being, you know, Lansdale volunteers to go find him. He's going to go on a rescue mission. So he walks outside the hotel and he thinks, all right, if I was Dick Lehman and I was drunk, where would I have gone? And he decides that Dick is in the hotel across the street. <laughs> so he goes to the hotel across the street. Sure enough, there's Dick in the lobby, drunk off his ass, staring like, where is everybody? Uh-huh. And so he kind of takes him by the arm and leads him back to the right hotel. <laughs> so, but... um. No, it was a, it was a neat moment because uh, you know I'm not gonna lie, Chet is a dear friend. Joe has become a dear friend. Yeah, his whole family are, are dear friends. But to me, they're always still gonna be Chet Williamson and Joe R. Lansdale, right? Um, but it was it was weird in in talking about books and such. They said a few nice things about my books and stuff I'm doing, and they were kind of treat me like an equal. So I, I guess I did fanboy a little bit inside because I'm like, fuck yeah, look at this, dude. <laughs> that's awesome, man. That, that's got to be a fantastic you know, feeling. Brian working back in the foundry. These motherfuckers dig you, you know. Um, so no, it was it was a great, great evening. The food was really good. We went to Appalachian Brewing Company in Harrisburg, PA. Shout out mm-hmm. to them. That was really good. Yeah, service yeah, yeah. was yeah. Very superb. Good. Um, you know, it was just, it was a really good time. Joe told me about a bunch of stuff he's got coming out. I can't talk about any of it yeah um but you know okay he specifically told me it it wasn't to talk about in the air so i won't but uh two new novels uh neither of them are horror uh one of them is is uh just a, a crazy fucking crime noir he was telling me about it it reminded me it, it's about a used car salesman it, the description reminded me a little bit maybe of uh better call saul but you know it's a Joe Lansdale novel, so it's going to be better than Better Call Saul, and I love Better Call Saul. But and the the other one is uh, sounds like a, a literary novel, um, so that'll oh, be nice. interesting. Uh, but yeah, he's got those coming out, and uh, you know, of course, Casey's working on stuff. Keith is working on stuff. I I don't know what I'm allowed to talk about and what I'm not, so I'm just not going to talk about any of it. Well, you can talk um, about the tomato story. You said it reminds oh about yeah, the tomato so story. here was something I didn't know about Joe. Um, and and Joe, I know you're listening. I apologize for sounding like a stalker, but uh, <laughs> you know, well, one day I, you know, I'm working. Some folks know this. I, I've been privately working on just a little biography of, about Dallas Mayor Jack Ketchum, you know, and uh, you know, one day I'd I'd like to do one on all these guys. I'd like to write a a biography on Lansdale and a biography on Scal and a biography on Chet. I mean, these guys are important. To our field and, I, and I, I think this stuff deserves to be talked about but uh you know we, the the character of hap from hap and leonard everyone knows that's joe you know it, right. it's based on joe down to working in the rose fields working at the aluminum chair factory he did all those things okay but here's something i didn't know before he was doing that he was growing t- tomatoes organic tomatoes and selling them to like restaurants and farmers markets and stuff huh um so we we had a chat about tomatoes because you know <laughs> our tomato garden out here it's it's like Lovecraft's color out of space. It is, it yeah. is a jungle. It's, it is know, wild it, out there. And Matt, your your wife thinks they're adorable. Quote unquote. You have adorable very tomatoes. adorable cherry tomatoes. But we yeah. have we have too many. I mean, our refrigerator is full. Well, now that I know that they're, they're fed f- with uranium, I don't want any more. <laughs> there, there are literally buckets. Of tomatoes, yeah, <laughs> we do have. Jesus Christ, them all away. I'll People take some. Like, oh, I still can't. I can't take anymore, Brian. We're eating the, the last twelve pounds you gave us last week. I, I would. Uh, I'd make more salsa, but 
the tomato plants have completely eclipsed all of my pepper plants. Yeah, the tomato plants took over the entire garden. And there's a point where you get really shits of salsa. Like, you're yeah, just like, I yeah. don't want to taste this anymore. Yeah. You think it's I can good- make like tomato <laughs> sauce, but it requires a lot more than just tomatoes, and right, yeah. we're not growing anything else. Yeah. So. It's a good thing that the tomatoes are growing now, because that, that takes care of the problem that you were having... Uh, earlier this summer. Oh, with the damn squash. With, 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 yeah. <laughs> yeah. They have managed to kill the squash. I thought nothing would kill that alien well, squash. And it wasn't even supposed to be there. No. It's that's like the, in that I, book. It, it was a Colorado <laughs> space situation. <laughs> <laughs> All right. It's so the anyway, uranium. Uh, again, if you missed the telethon, it's right there on YouTube. Go to the Brian King YouTube channel. The entire thing is there. You can also see the live test that I did the night before. Uh, with, with John helping me out and Dungeon Master helping me out, um, I did watch some of that. So it's pretty f- hilarious. The to live me. test, yeah. Because you're was, just like looking at it, you're like, I don't know what this is. <laughs> this fucking doing the. I don't. It was great because we're trying to figure out well, what, why why is there an echo? Why is there this right. or anything? Yeah, like that? And there's people in the chat room like this is pretty cool. Yeah, I don't think he even knows that we're here. <laughs> yeah, yeah. John, John's in the in the house listening, and Dungeon Master's at his mother's house, and he's texting me like. Dad, keep that sound effect. That's cool. And I'm like, no, we don't want that sound effect. <laughs> but, but uh, yeah, so thanks to everybody who donated. Uh, we yes. had a lot of people donate to all four. Um, we also had people who just didn't have the means to do that, and they you know, they picked Dave or Jim or Jack or Bill. Um, and all day, you know, we had people suggesting who, you know, if you could only donate to one, well, you know, like Paul Tremblay gave, and yeah. Tom Langan gave their pitches for Jack. Chris, of course pitch for Jim. Uh, Wes Southerd and Chris Enterline pitched for you, Dave, so you have to be nice to them from now on. Uh, <laughs> Chris Enterline. <laughs> <laughs> you know. I like Wes. I just, he's fun to pick on because he like takes everything so seriously. He, it's like, dude, I'm well, making shit up. <laughs> even though Wes doesn't know who King Diamond is, the folks at Death's yeah. Head Press do Wesley Southerd. Southerd. Uh, that's right. They have an anthology uh, coming out soon called Pulling Your Strings, a tribute to King Diamond. That's coming out in 2020. Uh, But they're telling you about it now because they want you to be excited and they want you to follow them on Twitter at Death's Head Press. And, and, you know, subscribe to their website, deathsheadpress.com, or like them on Facebook. And that way, you will know when this King Diamond book drops. And I I suspect that they're going to have some surprises in store between now and then. To get folks excited for it, and also uh, King Diamond's doing a U.S. tour this fall. That's right. So um, he'll be so in Baltimore in November. It's all very exciting. And speaking of exciting, hmm. I, I should mention our friends at AdamandEve.com as well because oh my. there's nothing more exciting. And Mary and I speak from personal experience on this. There's nothing more exciting than getting a discreetly marked package from AdamandEve.com in the mail. Uh, and you can get lingerie, oils, geranium, toys, movies. <laughs> uranium powered dildos. Like <laughs> oh my god! Uranium dildos. <laughs> and of course, uh, if you're going to do that, you might as well get some free stuff to go with it. And the only way to do that is why to not? Keen in in the the offer code section at checkout. K double E N E. Um, so we thank both of them for sponsoring this week's show. <laughs> I'm not. I'm not sure. Uh, God help them. <laughs> gifts, gifts, gifts for him. Gifts for her. Gifts for me. Gifts for you. <laughs> gifts for the entire Lansdale clan. And speaking of which, let's go to them now, and we'll catch you on the flip side. We we have a whole lot of superstars on this here stage, like Run DMC used to say. Uh, first of all, of all, we have filmmaker Hansi Oppenheimer. Yay! Uh, she runs the Grr and Fangirl podcast, which spotlights. Is this thing even on? <laughs> which uh, spotlights the achievements of women in the horror genre. Yay. Um, she also created SqueeCon. That's a convention with the sole purpose of uniting women, girls, femmes, and female identifying fans into a network. And you are doing good work with that. Um, but most recently, she completed a uh, short horror film called Transform Her, and of course, the Joe R. Lansdale documentary, All Hail the Popcorn King, which is premiering here in Austin tomorrow. Yay! Of course, you can't have a panel about Joe R. Lansdale's documentary without having Joe R. Lansdale himself. Where is he? And that panel wouldn't be any fun without 
author, singer, songwriter, and actress Casey Lansdale, <laughs> comic book writer Keith Lansdale, and I mean this with all sincerity, the June Carter of the Lansdale <laughs> family, Karen Lansdale. And Karen, I've been saying on my show for five years that you, you are my dream interview. Because you have the stories that no one's heard yet. Um, I interviewed And, and I, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of bummed that we don't have more time on this panel. Did you get, did you get the stories from I her, Hansi? All right, well, let's, let's start with you. Now, you, you grew up immersed in pop culture, TV, filmmaking. Your dad worked at CBS. Your mom ran a prop shop. So... I mean, you were pretty much set on this path right away. Did you ever, like, want to be a scientist or an astronaut, or no. you knew you always no. wanted to do this? Yeah. No, I, I knew I was always going to be in the arts. Um, I didn't know it was going to be documentary, but I, I wanted to be an artist. And then I was doing um, painting and sculpture, and then I started adding um, film to it, I guess, in the early 80s. And then um, I went back to film school in my 30s and worked as a TA with documentarians. And it just sort of found my voice there. Right. Okay. And, uh, you know, you, you, you said you, you went back in your 30s. Um, was, it, was it difficult at that, going back at that time? Was like everybody else in filmmaking school younger and doing their... Yeah, talk about that a little bit. Um, so, yeah, I had kind of a weird uh, childhood. So uh, I was kind of a throwaway at 14. Um, my parents got divorced. Things went kind of crazy. I ended up living on the street, living sort of a Andrew Vax book. Um, so it, oh Lord, baby! <laughs> wow. <laughs> so here we go. Anyway, so uh, besides, my name is Hansi, and I'm an alcoholic. Anyway, uh, besides uh, going uh, down there. <laughs> anyway, so yeah, it took me a long time to sort of um, learn how to take care of myself. Right. So I had a kid when I was 19. Um, so 30s was when I kind of became an adult. Right. Um, so yeah, I was in film school, and it was a private film school, which huge mistake. Don't do that. Don't spend a hundred thousand dollars for a film education. It's a waste of money. Um, <laughs> but um, yeah, everyone else, parents were paying for their film school, and I was working, you know, two jobs to pay for it. Right. Um, I mean, I'm glad I did it, but honestly, just I just should have put that a hundred thousand dollars into filmmaking. Right. Your uh, your thesis film was a twenty minute long doc. Um, called Riding the Broom. It was about love spells. Picked up by Universal's Hypnotic. Was that a, did, I mean, you're, you're saying, you know, it was a waste of money to go back, and, you know, you're working two jobs, but was that a moment of, you know, damn, maybe maybe I can do this? Um, I, I, all my films have been distributed. I've always gotten, the films have always, you know, done well. Yeah. Um, but I, I wasn't smart about making money on it. I, I think I'm just starting to get there about um, self-distributing because I, I did sign a lot of bad contracts over the years and that, right. took, that took a lot of learning and you know, having to figure that out. All right. Now, let's talk about, you told me this story not on the panel, but we, we have to work this story and you know which one I'm going to bring up. So, you, were you a fan of genre fiction all along when you're living that, that Andrew Vex oh, life? Oh yeah. yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Clive Barker oh, was yeah, her absolutely. favorite, absolutely. and you have probably the only Clive Barker book signed by Allen Ginsberg. That's true. Talk about that. <laughs> well, so in the early 80s, uh, I was getting high a lot, and uh, ODing a lot, not on purpose, just trying to get high, and after you do that a couple times, they put you away, you know, assuming you're going to commit suicide. So I was in Bellevue, and um, Peter Orlevsky was also in Bellevue at the same time, and um, he was... Ginsburg's longtime partner. And Ginsburg came to visit him in the day room, and I was reading Books of Blood. So I asked Alan Ginsburg, Would you sign my book? And he said, So happy to see you here, Hansi. <laughs> Love Alan Ginsburg. <laughs> now, was it in Bellevue where you first discovered Lansdale's work as well? Oh, no, or? no, no. No? no. 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 When, yeah. when, <laughs> thank God. <laughs> no. I mean, there, there are. When you go to Bellevue, they pass you a copy one of my books. <laughs> Here you go. Here's your slippers. Good luck. Here's your Lansdale yeah. novel. Yeah. <laughs> I know, and I'm sure this comes up in the documentary, uh, you know, myself, Joe Hill, Jeremy Robert Johnson, Robert Ford, Mary San Giovanni, J.F. Gonzalez, the list goes on and on. 
all of us have talked at one point about the drive-in was our first introduction to Joe's work. Um, you know, it had a major impact on every one of us, development-wise, and not just us, a, a generation of creators. Um, and I know for me, the Magic Wagon had a big personal impact for me. What were some, like, what was the first one you discovered? What else had a big impact on you? Um, so I, I don't honestly remember if it was Night Runners or um, the, the Night They Missed a Horror Show because it was around that period, you know, the, the, the splatter punk, you know, I got turned on to your stuff. And, um, but the drive-in and the magic wagon are particularly um, favorites of mine. We are kin. Uh, yeah. yeah. I mean, they're just amazing. And then when, when I did interview Joe in Nagadocious two years ago, the first time I finally got to meet him after, you know, loving his work since the 80s, um, I asked him, you know, about the drive-in, and he told me about the popcorn story, and I just became completely obsessed, and which is why the movie's called All Hail the Popcorn King. And uh, maybe Joe would want to tell us the popcorn story. <laughs> yeah, well, I, I, I blame my wife for this. <laughs> for, fortunately, if you don't like my books, my wife's to blame, and if you do, she's to praise. Uh, story you know, she could push you off that no, stage. She could, she could. <laughs> but uh, what oh, happened yeah, is that when we, and really it was more the short stories, but the, the novel too, um, we would have popcorn, we would have movie nights where we watched bad movies, and we would have friends over. And she would make this popcorn in a big pan where she had to shake it. But what she'd do, she would put what, this was before our Watch What You Eat days, and she would put a thing called Krogo in it, which was essentially just lard from Kroger. And it was just like you put big scoops of lard and you get this grease hot, and then you pop the popcorn and you, you shake it. And then it gets ready and we put it in the bag. Yeah, I'm, I've got that shape. <laughs> we, we, we put it in the bag and then we would eat it till we were unfortunately sick. And when I would go to bed at night, I'd try to go to sleep and I'd go, oh God, I feel miserable. And I would have all kinds of weird dreams and I'd get in the morning and I'd go, that's a story. And I would go write it down. And every one of them I was doing like that, it sold. And uh, one of the, the drive-in was a, was a continuous dream because we had popcorn a couple of nights in a row and then even after we quit having it, I'd started this whole, you know, series of dreams about it. And I could always know when our bank account was getting low because I'd look at Aaron Carey being there <laughs> shaking that popcorn. And, uh, but that popcorn became, it was like a gateway for me for a long time. Then I got to where I could just go through that gate without that. But I really believe that because it disrupted my dreams, it let, let me pick things that were not normally the sort of thing you're going to do as a story because I don't plot, I don't outline. Because for me, if I do that, I lose interest in the, in the story. And uh, in fact, I, I found one the other day I was telling Casey about that I had written up this whole outline and everything. And I realized I never wrote it when I got through it. I thought, I don't want to write that anymore. I know what happened. <laughs> but that was the popcorn. And the popcorn fueled a lot of my early career. Most of the stories in Bumper Crop are popcorn stories. And the drive-in is definitely a popcorn novel. Yeah, I just became obsessed with that. It was such a, that's why I all held Popcorn King. It's just such a fascinating, and everyone I interviewed asked, like, do you know about the popcorn story? Is it real? Did you? And Don Coscarelli had his own experience with that's the popcorn. Why. He, because he stayed with you when he was working in Baba Hotep. And apparently in the basement, you warned him about the water moccasins. And he said he had nightmares about and the I water made, moccasins. And I just joking with him. He didn't know that. <laughs> I did that. People would come to visit us, and I'd say, and if the snake alarm goes off, just pick your feet up. Now, I, I can vouch for this. <laughs> About two years ago, we're all at a convention, and, and Karen and Mary San Giovanni are behind the table. Now, if you know anything about me, you know I am deathly afraid of snakes. I, they're unnatural, and they should be exterminated. <laughs> and it won't hurt the planet if we get rid of them all tomorrow. But I hear Karen and Mary talking, and, and they're talking about Mary and I coming to Nacogdoches and visiting, and, and Karen showing Mary a picture on her phone of this giant... I, I'm sure it looked bigger to me because of no, my fear. It was that big. It was a rat snake. Yeah, a rat snake <laughs> on their porch. And Mary's thinking to herself, well, we'll never get Brian to go visit that. <laughs> but, you know, Joe's sitting, so I want to look cool. I'm like, yeah, that's cool. Anyway. <laughs> and later I'm like, no, we can't go to Nicodemus. <laughs> so it's all your fault, Karen. Yeah. I love you. Yeah. And, and how many of you are HWA members? Here's a little fact. Yeah. That is also Karen's fault. Yeah. 
Yeah, Although that, that, that's a good that's a good thing, and this is a good thing. That's amazing. So. That. That's She's the founder. Of yeah. Yep, absolutely. Not anybody else you think? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And I heard the story about that in an elevator, right? Mm -hmm. Why don't you tell that? Why don't you tell? Yeah. That? Oh, you no. Tell about me in the elevator. Yeah, sure, yeah, yeah. sure. Yeah. <laughs> that's why you're up here. Yeah. About McCammon in the elevator. I was in the elevator, and somebody started talking about how you can tell they're Southerners. And so we turned around, and it was Rick McCammon and Sally McCammon in the elevator with us. And we started talking about what he was trying to work for was to get the group, you know, so that they could all be in contact. And he says, but I just don't have time for it. And I said, I'll do it. <laughs> the idiot that I am. <laughs> and so I did it. And we were all happy. And it's lasted how long in my hair? It's an amazing thing. What she's not saying is this is before email. So what she typed up every single thing. She collected everybody's addresses. She, you know, wrote it up, typed it up, printed it out, or however Xerox. typewriters work. It's she wrote it out. It's before my time. And, and then she'd stick it in an envelope. She'd put a stamp on it. Take it. To, you know, it was it was not just like hey, I'm shooting out an email to get a, a mailing no. list. It was her going up to everybody, um, excuse me. Uh, I was, <laughs> and she used to write some of the articles, too, like for uh, Mystery Scene magazine. Mm -hmm. And, uh, um, yeah, you wrote, wrote articles for Mystery Scene magazine, but what she isn't telling you either is that once she got it going, she was the one that kept it organized, kept everybody on the list. And then Dean Coons came along and he said, okay, Joe, Karen, I got some money. I'll put some money into it. And uh, Karen said, sure, that's great. <laughs> <laughs> and then officers and stuff were put together. So. Yep. But like a true fan girl, you organized the whole thing. That's I had amazing. a lot of spare time. I worked at the fire department, and unless we had a call, we were just all kind of standing around. It's amazing. <laughs> hey, Mara, you're so much for that. It's so Nobody's good. on fire, everybody's yeah. okay. You know, and she was the first female um, dispatcher in Nacogdoches. And for the fire department, yeah, because that was before nine one one. So she was. Uh, they said, "Oh, you can't. Women can't do it." And later, when they come back, when she left, everybody said, "Can we get Karen back?" <laughs> <laughs> so, Hudson, originally, you go to Nacogdoches to interview Joe for your YouTube channel. It wasn't going to be a documentary at no. first, correct? No. So, how did it then evolve into what we're going to be watching tomorrow? Um. Uh, so we did the interview and by phone originally, wasn't it? No, no. I, you, I was going in. You said. Well, I was thinking. I was going back to Joe Bob Briggs part. I'm sorry. But yeah, yeah. yeah. So uh, I came to she's and you at your dojo. That's and, right. Um, you know, asked you questions about every single book you'd ever written. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> and um, put it on YouTube, and then I was working on a documentary at Joe Bob Briggs, and I asked Joe if he would contribute. And, you know, Joe, I said, can you do a video? And Joe's like, I can write something. And in 24 hours, he sent me this piece that was so fucking beautiful and it made me cry and made me laugh. And I was so incredibly touched that, like, he wrote this thing for my piece that was amazing. Um, I was like, the next documentary I do is going to be about you. And Joe, of course, is like, nah, 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 nah. you don't have to do that. And I was like, I really do. And I did. And um, when I started doing it, I just put out the word, and it was amazing. Like, every writer was like, yes, I want to be a part of this. Yeah. Joe's meant so much to me. You know me. how much that cost me to get those guys to do that? <laughs> <laughs> well, Joe, let's talk about that. Not the money you still owe us, but <laughs> um, I mean, no one can argue. You've had a spectacular career. You've had commercial success. But you, you've had academic critical success too. I mean, there, you know, there are papers that have been written about your work. But had anyone ever proposed a documentary before this? There actually was one uh, that was done in Italy. Uh, uh, there was a, uh, Chiara Stengelino directed one. And it was originally supposed to be, I think, an hour and a half long, but it got cut down to 30 minutes. And you can still find it online. It's on YouTube. Yeah, it's on YouTube. And it's, it's good. And it took a different different tack. It was much more in my day-to-day -day life sort of thing. Right. And uh, so there had been that, but there had, and there was a biography of me that was written in Italy too, uh, that's kind of a biographical thing. But this was the first longer uh, version, you know, and, and it's uh, 48 minutes. Uh, Although 
<laughs> we could probably make it four hours yeah. <laughs> easily. Well, she's going to have special features. Yeah, they'll be so, featurettes. So that would be, yeah, it would be the first, certainly the first American and the first larger scale one. And, uh, uh, you know, I had no idea how she was going to approach it. And uh, it ends up, it's got animation in it. It's, it's got, you know, friends in it. It's got fans in it. It's got my family in it. Uh, it's got, it, it, it's really, really nicely done. And she did a great job. And Brian, where's my, this, Brian. this guy is the, is the editor, you know? <laughs> and, and since I haven't seen the last version, I'm not going to give him any credit chance. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you, you say you got friends in it and you do. I mean, you know, Don Coscarelli, Bruce Campbell, uh, James Purfoy, James Purfoy. I think F. Paul Wilson's in it. Although, uh, he didn't make the final cut. Oh, he didn't make, oh, Paul. <laughs> oh. Paul, he ended up on the, well, buy the DVD, Paul. Mick it's Harris. up for pre-order. Mick, uh, Mick Harris is in it, yeah. Um, David Scow. Yeah. David. David Scow's in it. You know, and your family's in it. Sitting, sitting where you are, do you start to worry, oh, is somebody going to tell a story I don't want? Am I giving people too much access to my family? Does that cross your mind at all? No, that didn't no. cross my no. That didn't cross my mind. Uh, I mean, my family could probably tell the worst stuff on me if they're going to do it. Well, that's what I'm thinking. Yeah, yes. Yeah, so yeah. We're going to get to them in just a moment. Well, when we got to the pit bull, he had a lot to say. Oh. Well, Nikki, Nikki's in it. Nikki's in it. Nikki's yeah. in it. Yeah. But no, I, I never really thought about that. Yeah. So you're looking forward. To, have you seen it? Have you seen? I, I saw the one before the one that's going to show tomorrow. So it had not had final edits, and I think there were some other additions or subtractions. I'm not sure. So tomorrow will be the first time I've seen the final cut. Okay. Yeah, Joe at a certain point was like, "Okay, you're good. You go." Yeah. You know. Yeah. I mean, early on, I showed you know showed him versions, and uh, at one point he's like, "We can't have four hours of people telling how great I am. That's not going to work." So I was like, <laughs> "Okay, all right, all right, different tack. We'll we'll go that way." Not so, that I didn't enjoy it. <laughs> <laughs> and then the martial arts, he was very specific about that it had to be video. It couldn't be photographs because it had to be seen in motion. So there were things that, you know, I asked him about and he was very specific about. And, you know, you have a master storyteller. You're going to trust him with structure. It's like, okay, Joe, right. you know, I get you. Um, but, yeah, he hasn't seen the, the final version. Now, as you're interviewing these people, I mean, you know, like we said, David Scow, Bruce Campbell, Don Coscarelli. I mean, from a from a fangirl perspective, is that daunting? Is there tradition <laughs> talking to them? Not at all. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it was fun. Oh, yeah, Bruce Campbell was rough. Um, and <laughs> Bruce well, is a sweetheart. Well, I, so we did it on the phone, and um, I could tell in the beginning Bruce was very much doing it as a favor to Joe. He he, could, he was like, "This is Bruce." Like, like, oh, here we go, you know, just, just give it to me, let me get it over with. And then, like, once we started chatting, and I'm like, you know, I really love your work in this, and this is really interesting, and then we started, you know, once, once I warned him up and he understood what I was coming from, then he started, like, cracking wise, and I knew I had him. Yeah. And, like, he was like, yeah, like, Joe, Joe can kill you with his hands, he can kill you with his words, he's a killer. And then, like, the two of us were cracking up, and, like, I got him. But uh, the beginning was rough, there was, like, it was like, he just... Yeah, he, it was a duty. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, dude, when I, I, I had an email with him the other day, and I said, hey, man, I want to thank you again for this. He said, I'm going to think you've got some talent. you got, you got you got something like that. So I think you might make it, kid, or something. <laughs> <laughs> that's a blur. <laughs> but we, we do that back and forth Aww. all the time. I, and that's why I'm telling you, he's a sweetheart. We, we joke all the time with he's each great. other. And, uh, you know, he's a, he's a good guy, and he's, he's a good right. friend. Yeah. yeah. And so is Don and all those people. Yeah, yeah. All right, well, Casey, Keith, now... I, you know, Casey, you and I have known each other a long while now, and Keith, I've gotten to know you over the last couple of years. I know both of you, I don't want to say you've struggled with it, but you, you've had to walk that line between doing it on your own and, and getting past people who perhaps only want to work with you because of who your dad is. Um, so when you're, when you're doing something like this, you know, it's about your dad, you love him, you want to support him in the documentary. How do you how do you walk that balancing line, or does that not even come up for something you like want this? It or you want me to <laughs> <laughs> first. Right. Ladies first. Ladies first. Wow, that never, in our life. Right, you lost your chance. <laughs> 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 I was like, wait a minute, it's a big moment. Um, no, it it is 
I think for me, it's easier than it is for my brother. I think for the sole fact that I'm female. I think that there is a, a little bit of a different expectation. You also had the singing. Well, and that was my next point, is I think there's a little bit of a different expectation for the writing for me. And also, I think most people understand that my first and foremost love is music and singing and songwriting. So I think there's a little bit less of an expectation of that. And so that's you know the punctuation of the first part of that. But there is definitely the constant thing of having to walk that line of, are they asking because it's a connection with dad? And if so, is that so bad? Because at least I'm lucky enough to be asked, but is it really me that they're at? So there's a lot of things. And, and I think it would be easier if I wasn't as close to my dad as I am. Because then you just go like, ah, oh, he sucks. I mean, but you, at the same time, he loves us and only wants us to succeed. So sometimes he'll push us out in front when maybe we shouldn't be pushed out in front. He'll say, oh, you should ask my daughter. And I'll, in my head, sometimes I'll think, well, they should ask me if they want me, not because you're gearing them there. But then you look at the other side and you go, well, it's your dad. Of course he's pushing you where you can go. And if it helps, that's what you know, we all want. So it is, it is a fine line, and it's, it's sometimes not easy. And I often, um, you know, I, I think very... Children like John Carter Cash, who is my friend and music producer, I think about the life he must live having Johnny Cash as his father. You can't walk in a restaurant and not hear him singing. You, you can't spend a day without having some sort of pop cultural reference. So I can only imagine the type of struggles that he has because that's just a, a different level. But I do know that when people find out who my father is, the interest immediately of anything that we were discussing is gone and it's all about like so tell me about your dad <laughs> and, and it it's hard but as you as i get older it becomes easier because i also understand it's not about me in the sense of it's not against me it has nothing to do with me and my importance or lack of importance is a separate entity and they just love his work and that's not against my work or against my contribution but I do feel sometimes, I mean, the other two days ago, I got a call and dad was like, probably gonna get a call about this story because this guy asked me to write and I told him no. And I was like, oh, it feels so good. <laughs> yeah. Nothing is nicer than, I told him no, so he'll probably call you. <laughs> <laughs> I've never felt more wanted. I mean, he wants the smaller lamb. Yeah, you know, I really could talk about this for a long time, but at the end of the day, how, you, how I reconcile it is knowing that as a father, he's always been the best father you can ask for. So I have to understand that everything is done with the best of intention, even if sometimes it's more painful than it should be. Because at least I still have my father taking care and I'm not, you know, having pro I'm not running the streets at sixteen and I'm not having all these problems. So and I get touched because that's my first <laughs> I don't care as long as the check clears. <laughs> no, I mean, seriously, there is a lot of that that comes from everything that I've had in the beginning part of mine has been dad turning it down and pushing in my direction. And we can all pretend like, you know, oh, what a burden that is. But the real truth is, is that instead of trying to claw my way up every damn bit of everything I've had to do, luckily he already carried me all the way up that damn hill. So I don't look at it as anything as like, you know, oh, no, I'm the second pick. I think that makes sense he's the first pick he's badass that doesn't hurt my feelings at all so yeah i'm second pick cool i can i can be second place today. Yeah, that doesn't hurt my feelings at all but like i said that check better clear but, you, you, <laughs> but i will say that that keith has made the point too of telling people you know uh my name's supposed to be on this because i wrote it not that and he's right yep you absolutely. know that's it and and the thing about the kids that i will say they're successful because they're talented and they work their asses off. They work their asses off. But people do, sometimes don't know that or think that. Because all I do is say, here's an opportunity. But they grew up with this stuff. You know, they grew up with uh, directors in the house and writers in the house and artists in the house and screenwriters in the house, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So they've always been around it. And so they don't, you know, they don't have to have that learning curve that I did living out in the woods, never met a writer, never met an agent. Never met an editor, so that's the advantage. Can we borrow that again for a second? Yep, absolutely. That is a big part, and I'm sure Casey probably echoes this as well, but 
a big part of it is, and not knowing at the time, is that I was in a master class growing up here of learning how to write. I mean, to me, I was a kid watching a lot of goofy movies and talking to dad about why I liked movies or why I didn't like movies or why you know certain things worked or why certain dialogues stuck out or why certain scenes were important. I didn't realize any of that was actually something about developing a story or telling a, you know anything. I, I didn't know any of that. And then as I got older and started writing, I realized that I was drawing on all this stuff that I didn't know I had locked away for another day. So, uh, yeah, I, once again, you know, we, we have talent, but it's only because Dad has literally put so much effort into making sure we know what the hell we're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> They're fighting over the microphone again. I don't mean. <laughs> no, um, one other thing, though, that I don't think Keith struggles with, and this is probably PMI, but we're, we're putting it on the table, so why not? Um, I have a lot of guilt because I see a lot of talented writers that are scrapping and working all the way up who I would say are far better authors than I am because they've spent the time honing that skill differently than I have. I spent my life dedicated to singing and music, and I would say that I am good at that. But as an author, that's still something that I'm learning, and I, I feel the guilt sometimes to get that opportunity when I see people who have put in the same time that I've put in musically, and I, I have to kind of balance that out. But then, if, what do you say? No, I'm sorry, please don't give me that opportunity. Now, Casey, I know you haven't seen the movie. No. You and I were talking about it earlier. Keith, have you seen it yet? No, I haven't seen it. So you you both, I mean, you, <laughs> everyone's going to kill me tomorrow. <laughs> you've grown up, you know, you've grown up in a household. You know all the stories. I mean, you know, fans know a lot of the stories, like the stuff you've written about in essays, Joe, and and you know, your your peers like like David or Don, they know some other stories. Are you after the dirt? No, I'm not after the dirt. I'm wondering is is there anything the two of you think you might learn about your father that you don't know? Maybe from one of the fans' perspectives that it's in it or something. Have you met him? He never stops talking. There's literally not a story he has left in him that I have not heard. Probably three times. And the thing is, is that if he starts telling a story we already told him, we say, we know, we can't stop him. <laughs> Yes. Yeah. I'd actually be surprised to see if they're new just because I'd be like, holy shit. <laughs> what I do is new. if they do that, I go, and that reminds me of another <laughs> Well, Brian actually asked me this question before the panel. He said, do you think you're going to learn anything new? And I just said, no. <laughs> that was it. Because Not only because of that, put so eloquently, but also because I, I think I, it would be hard-pressed that, first of all, she's not going to make a documentary where people say a lot of negative stuff, and I don't think you're going to find a lot of negative stuff. There isn't I think any. He's lived his life yeah. in a way that, even if um, wronging someone, it was always everything was always done with the best of intention and, and pure heart, and I believe that. Never done with malice. Never done with malice, uh, no. yes. And I, I believe that there will not be anything that comes up that would be new information, because I think it would be a documentary of four hours of, oh, we love Joe, because my whole life everyone has loved my dad, and thank goodness for it. Yeah. So, so, yeah, all that. Yeah. No, no new information. Yeah. And that's not that kind of film, and I don't, I don't think there is that film. I mean, Joe's out there about who he is, and, you know, he... You know, he's straight up. I mean, that that's one thing sort of I, I and it's sort of funny, like New York punk, but, and you know, East Texas, totally different lifestyle, but we have like similar philosophies in terms of like, we don't bullshit people. You know, we respect people for their hard work. Um, you know, you, you work hard and you dedicate yourself. Well, you can't yourself. make everybody happy. And, and you know, I never set out to make everybody love me and not everybody's going to, but you, you, have, to, you have to live it as honest as you can. And I think philosophically, we both have that at, in terms of our art and our lives. So we, you know, that that's the film. That's what it's about. And we connected there. Okay. Well, I want to I wanna give everybody a chance to ask questions. Anybody here, <laughs> before we do, though, anybody here in the room actually going to the premiere tomorrow? Okay, wow. All right. Well, we will see you all there. Um, for Be those, happy it's sold out. Yeah. I bought the rest of the tickets. No. <laughs> For those of you who can't, uh, the DVD is up for pre-order right now. Uh, what's the website, Hansi? Uh, Sweeprojects.com. Yep. S-Q-U-E-E. -E. Squee! Squee! Projects. Projects. We're giving books away tomorrow, too. Yeah. yeah. Signed. Now sell books. Yeah. So, and, and for everybody that's, has a ticket. That DVD has all the, un so that that's the F. Paul Wilson cut? Yeah, it'll yeah. be uh, all the, okay. that's all the, uh, yeah, the, the F. Paul Wilson, Wilson cut. cut. Hey, we wow. only fit so many in. We had to. We we did have to cut 
you know, a lot of really great people out just, just to make it make sense. Okay. So. All right, so let's go to the audience. Yeah, I, you're jumping up and down. Go. Well, thank you. Thank you. I really appreciate it. You're not a nobody. Yeah, I know. I know. You're. I really appreciate that. You are welcome. Who's next? Before I ask a question, do you guys want to learn something new about your dad? <laughs> <laughs> oh, so, uh, what did you, did you stop bedwetting? <laughs> <laughs> that was my dog, man. Nikki. <laughs> <laughs> Nikki. Yeah. We did have Nikki in the film. Yeah, Nikki's my uh, our pit bull. Uh, he's he is a he's ridiculous. spoiled rotten. He's adorable. People always talk, oh, vicious pit bull. Uh, no. no, a rabbit. Yeah, a, a rabbit chased him up the drive. It was embarrassing. I, I put a sack over my head. Uh, you're my dog, and you let a rabbit chase you up the drive, and, and then the rabbit. And my wife has a photo of this. The it's rabbit great. comes around to the window. I thought they had a bad story, but they sent me a photo, and the rabbit's like... Yeah, the rabbit comes... I got your ass. Come on out! Finger to the window. But it really is, the rabbit will come to the window, and look at that, and he'll be out in the yard, and Nick will come out, and the rabbit will like... You looking at me? Pretty funny. Who's next? Yes? Uh, your birthday's a couple days before Halloween. That's right. Mine is on Halloween. Are there any Halloween family land sale traditions? No! <laughs> <laughs> Don't do it! Do you want to no, you didn't. Oh, no! <laughs> there is one that is no longer in existence. We don't get to play this anymore. We, has anybody ever read M.R. James' Casting the Runes? Okay. okay. And it was made into a movie. Um, what was it called? Uh, Curse of the Demon. Curse of the Demon. Oh, yeah. And there was a British version and an American version. But anyway, the basic thing was there were these magical runes that if you possessed them, a creature from beyond would come and get you. And so you had to pass that rune by tricking somebody else into taking it and therefore putting the curse on them. You had to hand it to them. You, you had to hand like it to them, yeah. So <laughs> well, we, hand it. we made up a thing called the Wee Wee Rabbit. Guess what it does? Yeah, it pees on you. If, you. if you're still holding this, the demon rabbit will come and pee on you. So that was our deal. And so we would start it a few days before Halloween and we would pass it around and go back from one of us to the other one. And Casey was pretty small then, which made it really easy to mess with. And, she, and uh, so what we would do is that we would pass it, keep passing, and, and all of them, we were all passing. And then at one point, Casey ended up with the room. And so she cleverly found a way I gave you a plate. Plate. I passed a plate for dinner, and, and I had the wee wee rabbit under the plate, and I passed it to him. And I took it, and then I said, "Oh, that was really cool. Here it is." And she took it, <laughs> <laughs> and she jumped up and down. She hopped like a rabbit, and that, that was she was so. Oh, there's that threatening rabbit, and she was so <laughs> mad that we never played that oh, game. The mom wouldn't let us. Yeah. <laughs> And we used to, when the kids, we'd be driving along and be going by and see some cows out in the pasture. I'd go, those are plastic. <laughs> what? And you're driving by pretty fast, and cows are not the most, you know, exciting bunch of critters. And they go, plastic? I said, yeah, they said plastic cows out in the, in the field, you know. You think they put real cows out there? And they're like, <laughs> and then, then they go, mom, are those plastic cows? And then she would ruin it. <laughs> and I, I remember Keith came home. I said, Keith, do you know any alligators? He went, no. I said, well, one came to the door today. He said he was supposed to have lunch with you. <laughs> what? Yeah, he said he'd be back later. <laughs> I was real concerned. <laughs> so there are some mean things in there. But 
I was trying to feed their imagination, and I think I think it did. Also known as terrifying. Terrifying. <laughs> I would leave, and then I'd come back, and all of my stuff was like in a different place. My stuffed animals had moved, and I was like, "It's happening." <laughs> yeah. 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 One thing too is that I was a house dad, so. I, I took care of them while Karen was working at the fire department and then later the police department for the while that she did that. In fact, Keith now has her old job. He works as a dispatcher as well as writes, you know he writes comics, he writes screenplays. Yep. He's, he has a film that was made that he co-wrote called The Pale Door that's a weird western that comes out next year, right? Next year. So, I mean, he's, he's doing all that too. But back then, uh, they were home all the time. I remember Keith, I, I, I hung out with all the ladies in the town that had uh, uh, their kids, because most of the guys, were, they were not gonna do that. I was happy to do that, because I had my son with me all the time. And we would talk about diapers and all that sort of stuff, and they called me Mr. Mom. And then when Casey was born, uh, about four years later, uh, she, I took care of both of them for about another, what, two years, roughly, something like that. When Karen, we, I started making enough money, I, and Karen said, I don't, I don't I hate my job now, I'm tired, I've been doing it a long time. I said, I think if you quit, we would do even better, and we tripled our income within a few months. But I had the luxury, even though I was writing, I had the luxury of having my children with me at home. And Keith, one time, I had to write a screenplay, he's evil. But when, when he was little, yes, with the hammer, when he was little, I had a deal where they said, I got a, it's the first time I ever written a screenplay, I'd never even seen one. And my brother had made this contact based on my novel, Dead in the West. And these people said, we need to see a screenplay. I said, sure, I'll do one, I'll figure it out. And because you couldn't go and get stuff off the internet then, and you couldn't find screenplays. So about, he called me the next day, he said, well, I'm coming by tomorrow, I'll get the screenplay. I said, what? And I said, I didn't mean I'd have it tomorrow. He said, well, I told him you would. I said, well, I can't. And so that night, about 3 a.m., or in the morning, about 3 a.m., I started writing. And then in the morning, I had to get up, take care of Keith, and, you know, feed him, diaper him, all that. And so all day long, he would sit in my lap with a plastic hammer and beat me in the testicles. <laughs> it's called motivation. Yeah. <laughs> On a manual typewriter. And I wrote, and my brother arrived at 5 o'clock. I pulled out the last page seconds before he knocked on the door. And I had never seen a screenplay. I optioned that thing 11 times, finally sold it for a quarter million dollars to a French company that will never make it and won't let us have it back. Bruce Campbell and Don tried to go into a partnership with them. A lot of other people did. But they're not all, you know, light and, and sweetness either. So I just wanted to put that. He had his own plastic hammer in it. <laughs> I've never forgotten it. It's buried in the backyard. <laughs> Who's next? Really? Yes, go ahead. Uh, um, one of the things that has drawn me to you is your connection with your fans. And uh, back I, when uh, your website first went up, it went, you can send me a book for an autograph if you send me, you know, but you were also very clear about, I don't want to see stuff coming up on eBay, right? I can tell whether you are a fan or you're trying to, you know, just flip a bunch yeah. of books. What, I mean, with how busy you are, how do you decide which fans to connect with? Um, um, anyone that writes me and I see it, I connect with them if I can. I mean, uh, and I try to respond to everybody on the fan page. Sometimes, I, or Twitter, sometimes I can't, you know, because I don't <laughs> see it all because I'm, I'm busy. But my deal wasn't that I care. I don't care if you put it on eBay. If I sign it's your book, you put it on eBay. What I was saying is that when somebody wants to send me a box to sign just so you can make money off on eBay and I'm signing 20 books and taking my time to do it, I didn't want to do that. And the other thing is that people would write and say, you know, give me a book, send me a book. I said, well, you know, if I try to do this, and, and believe me, I do send books to people from time to time because I want to. Yeah. But I don't want to get into the situation where everybody thinks that I'm their source for the books because I buy them used or I, I buy them uh, remainder or in some cases they're part of my contractual deal and so who I give books to is my choice and uh, sometimes people would want those or they'd say you know I, I want to sign photograph I said there's enough horror in the world you know <laughs> you don't need it and besides I don't I don't go around with sign photographs and things like that and I, I didn't do that wouldn't want to do it but that you know I try to respond to the fans. I don't let the fans run my life, but I try not to ruin their life. 
And if somebody really is interested in my work and wants to know something, I always try to answer it as honestly as I can. You know, so I, I feel like these are the people who put beans on my table. When I go to these things, I've gone to some deals where writers go, I, I don't want to sign autographs. God damn, let me sign one. You know, I worked, I, this is 46 years that I've been a, uh, a writer and 30 something of it is full time. I'm very excited to sign anything that somebody put their money out, uh, swapped a pig for, whatever it is that allowed them to own that because they wanted it. That means a lot to me, you know, and uh, I hope it means something to them too. So to me, I care about the fans. I always say when I write, I don't write for the fans though. I don't write for anybody. I write like everybody I know is dead. That's my motto. Because that way I'm not trying to figure out what my agent wants, my editor wants, my children want, my wife wants, the pit bull. He has a little more, he has a little more sway. But, but I, I try to write for myself so I'll do the book I want or the story I want. And then when I get done, I hope everybody likes it. That doesn't mean if somebody says, look, I got a mummy story I'd like you to do. I go, oh, that sounds kind of fun. I think I'll do that. But then still, I've got to find my own way into it. And I, I get excited about things. I, I can almost write anything and love it because I get excited about writing in general. I mean, I've, I've, I've been writing ever since I was four years old. So to me, to be able to do this for a living and for any of you to buy any of it means a lot to me. There's actually a quick story. Uh, an old, a dear friend of mine I've known since I was like 14, scurvy bastard, um, he had lost his daughter to an OD when she was like 20. And I think Garth Ennis or Steve Dillon actually asked you to sign a bunch of books for him and you said to him and you didn't know him and it just meant the world to him. It was just like a kindness. You know, that I had to do it. Keith, Keith, you got to follow up, and then I got to follow up to your follow up. So this was a good question. Too. Well, I think it's kind of one of those that Dad might have covered because, like I said, he never stops talking. But either way, <laughs> no, it, it's something that he told us a long time ago, and obviously, it's not like I've got this big problem yet. But he said, make sure to take your time for anybody who comes up as a fan. He said these people, they they thought you were important enough to put their time into, their money into, and what they want is just a moment for you to sign a book or talk to you for a second. He said these are the people that. You know, they make this life happen so it's something that he's always preached and I think it's a really great thing that he's never one of those people that's like oh now that I'm big and famous I don't have time for my fans I mean he he takes time for everybody and he there's never anybody that he hasn't met that doesn't quickly come afterward going oh, I really like that guy <laughs> so I think he's been a really good example to follow and I'm, I've never seen him do anything otherwise had said, although it was paraphrased, but Mick Garris had originally said, if you've read Joe Lansdale, you love Joe Lansdale. And I think it's actually, if you know Joe Lansdale, you love Joe Lansdale. Because either, either you know him and you're like, oh my God, yeah, he's awesome. Or like, it's not. <laughs> so there, there doesn't seem to be a middle ground there. Yeah, I know. I mean, I met you as a fan. I, I had an inkling that I wanted to be, I, I knew I wanted to be a writer. I didn't know how to do it. But I, I've seen you interact with fans over the years. But Casey, I've seen you interact with fans as well. And I don't know if it's conscious or subconscious, but you interact with them in much the same manner as your dad. Do you think that's something you consciously picked up in watching him? I think, like my brother said, it was always put up front that you take the time, not just for a fan, but you take the time for people who want to engage with you and talk to you because that's, you know, decent. But especially as a fan, because of, like you said, these are the people who are letting you live this lifestyle. And I think a lot of why our mannerisms, our cadence, our style, a lot of that is similar also in writing, not just in speech pattern, is because of the fact that when I was little, he was house dad in those very early formative years. And we're both close to our mother, and but in a different way. So I think, you know, you kind of know which parent is the one you go to for different things. But in this instance, because it was something that he was doing and interacting with people all the time, Wonderful you money. just, Wonderful. yeah, <laughs> no, you just kind of learn as you do it. And also I think that's my personality in general. My personality is to connect with people. My personality is to want to know their story. And I enjoy hearing people, whether it's me, anybody in the family, I mean, there's, there's nothing nicer than when someone comes up and says, I read your dad when I was 16 years old and I stopped drinking or whatever it is. You know, those, those are important moments, not just for me, you know, but for those people. And a lot of it is because you go, oh, wow, my family, a piece of what my life is had an impact on this other person's life positively. 
and you want to give that back. I mean, and like Chuck, for example, I met Chuck because he's a, a rabid fan of my father's and I've gone <laughs> up to Minnesota and done house concerts and met wonderful friends of his and all these things that I wouldn't have been able to do. And, and I'm pretty sure you just like sent a thing on Facebook. With, I, me? Yeah. Yeah, so I mean, you know, it's just like, it's, it's cool when people do that because I think we all you relish the opportunity. You give yeah, you give if you've got the right mindset. Yeah, you relish the opportunity to have the interactions with people because also, you're, it, again, it may not seem like it in some instances, but you're working your ass off. So if somebody notices, it's like, oh, thank God. That means that all those shitty clubs I played where they didn't huh. turn the TV off in the background <laughs> and nobody gives a fuck if you're a jukebox or a human person, oh, it means at least one person noticed and listened. And all of those little shitty moments make those nice gigs and those nice opportunities worth it. Could I say something real quick? Sure. I want to just publicly acknowledge something that Casey did for us. She played a, a small concert <laughs> About a year later, uh, one of the young women, the fiance of a friend of mine, died from a brain aneurysm suddenly. And Casey supply, uh, sang on the uh, Amazing Grace and sent us a copy and we played it at the funeral. And I just want to say that is just one of the coolest things anything could, anyone could do. Thank you. I echo that. You know, we've done several signings together and, and watch, watching people come up to Casey every one of them every single one of them whether it was san diego or pennsylvania or wherever we were they walk away and you can tell they feel like they've had a genuine moment a genuine interaction okay. you know you. so for real so all right we probably got time for two more questions so and yes you can only be a part of the lansdale family now because <laughs> we all want that no you gotta you gotta ask a question i think that's the rule I, you know i got i got two things that make feel it if i make them quick right. one's a bill <laughs> paxton story and then one uh, is a story that happened to me in Tulsa, and I'll make them real quick. But not long ago, I was in Tulsa doing a signing, the first time I had done a signing in Tulsa, and it was just packed. It was uh, unbelievably uh, exciting. And one man came up to me, kind of a big guy, had you know, tattoos, and uh, you know, had a kind of a scowling looking face to me anyway. And uh, so I said, I'm gonna get to uh, experience some of my martial arts here. And, uh, <laughs> because I have done before, but, but this guy came to me and, and all honestly, he said, you know what? He said, you changed my life. I said, me? He said, Happ and Leonard changed my life. He said, they made me let go of all the hate. He said, I hated black people, gay people, all that stuff. And he said, when I started reading these books, and, I, I th and I've had that happen before, and that's not something that you expect. I mean, you hope you're making some. When that happens, you think all of those years of Karen and I living in, you know, not the best of conditions, uh, you know, sometimes uh, having an interruption in service because the water didn't work, or some, something you think all of that time is worth it. And another example is Bill Paxton, who was a friend of our family, and uh, was a, a friend for about eight or nine years. We were working on the bottoms to, to film it. And we had a screenplay done by Brent Hanley who did the screenplay for Frailty, which Bill wrote. And one time we, he was in Nacogdoches and we went into the IHOP to have breakfast. So we're sitting there and Bill has on his cap and his glasses. You know, he's not dodging big, but you know, he wants to have that moment. And we're sitting there and, uh, and uh, one of the waitresses comes over and says, you're Bill Paxton. You know, he said, you're a movie star. He said, no ma'am. Uh, Tom Cruise is a movie star, I'm an actor. <laughs> and he was, you know, he was just kind of joking. But but, uh, but then after that, when we got ready to leave and I was up, I, I went and paid and went outside with Brent, who was the, wrote the screenplay, uh, screenplay, Brent Handley. And we thought, who the hell's Bill? Because he, he said, well, he's out, I'm gonna run the bathroom. So we were, okay. So we're waiting outside for Bill. And after a little bit, we, where the hell is he? He's been in there 20 minutes. And then he came out and I said, we said, hey man, where you been? He said, I've been signing autographs for everybody, taking pictures with everybody. And, uh, and he said, Joe, you and I both know that all we ever wanted was a place at the table. I have never forgot that because he and I both, you know, he came from a different family. I think they were a little more elevated financially than mine, but I, I knew exactly what he meant, you know? And, and then he said, and guess what? Tomorrow when we come here for breakfast, I've already done that. And I said, guess what? They have different shifts. <laughs> Time for one more question if you make one more. Uh, no, okay. Hey! 
How did you feel about the Hack and Learn uh, TV show? And were you as disappointed as I was? I'm disappointed it's over. I loved it. Uh, I, I thought James Purefoy and Michael K. Williams just knocked it out of the park. I thought, in general, um, the scripts were 99 percent, 90 percent anyway, and sometimes 99 percent. I thought everybody that performed in it was well, part of them. Were, some of them have become members of our family, you know, because we've got so close to them. But I hate that it's gone. But I really feel James Purefoy and I both said this. Look, it's gone. We look great to have other uh, seasons, but man, we have got three killer seasons that are there now. And so you go on Netflix and watch them. Yeah, yeah they were perfect. Yes. Thank you. All right, well, one more time. Give it up for the Lansdale. Projects.com, pre order the DVD, all held popcorn king. Coming in mid 2020 from Death's Head Press is an anthology more than 30 years in the making. I am, of course, talking about Pulling Your Strings, a tribute to King Diamond, which celebrates the contributions of King Diamond to not only the heavy metal scene, but also to the horror genre as a whole. Featuring such authors as Rachel Autumn Deering, Matt Hayward, Ryan Harding, Armand Rosamilia, and Morgan Sylvia, all together to honor King Diamond. If you want to keep up on this release, go to deathsheadpress.com. That's deathsheadpress.com. Or follow them on Twitter at Death's Head Press. This week's show is also brought to you by our good friends at adamandeve.com, America's number one trusted source for all things in the bedroom. They have things for her, things for him, things for both of you. Be sure to use that offer code at checkout. What is that offer code once again? Why, it's Keen, K-E-E-N-E. -E. Put it in at checkout and you will receive 10 free tantalizing gifts as well as discreet shipping. That's adamandeve.com, offer code Keen. Right now at home, Karen Lansdale list, was listening to this whole thing, and you know, before we got to the interview an hour ago, she's like, "Wait, did he just equate us with Adam and Eve?" <laughs> <laughs> that I is thought, not how I, the bouquet of Lansdales wants I to be treated. He was a nice boy. <laughs> um, so no, that was that was a real treat to be able to to host that panel. Um, and Hansi's amazing. She's doing such good work. Uh, you know, check out. Uh, her her squee project um you know she's just she's spotlighting all the women in the genre and I, I think it's a really worthwhile endeavor um and yeah check out all hail the popcorn king if you hadn't there's uh screenings taking place all over the u.s i may be at a couple of them um we'll see but i i know they would like me to be at the one in new york but i just don't think i'm going to be able to make it I'm, I'm trying to clear my schedule but uh but yeah definitely check that out and of course uh you can pre-order the dvd right now as well so Sweet. anything else we want to cover this week before we go oh. um, crickets there are actual <laughs> crickets <laughs> appropriate <laughs> cricket noise in the background <laughs> i don't think so i haven't been doing anything going to the doctor so i you know i've been watching any tv or anything it's just doctor, yeah doctor, well, I, doctor 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 creep show is coming up at the end of this month i'm kind of excited about that yeah lansdale's excited about that too him yeah. and scow uh both uh have entries in that joe was telling mm -hmm. me a little bit about it um, and Scows is an original, I believe. Uh, really? Yeah, Joe and I were debating. Um, he, I thought it it was original, not based on anything David had ever written, like a short story. Right. And Joe said when he was reading the screenplay for it, he thought it sounded familiar, but then over dinner he was saying he thinks it's just because he's heard David tell him about the idea before. Uh, oh, okay. So, yeah, good stuff coming there. And where, where's that going to be on? Uh, that's going to be on Shutter. Okay. Our good cool. friends at yeah, Shutter. Right. Um, so next week, um, really good show. Next week we have Elizabeth Massey, Lee Thomas, Shane McKenzie, and myself. We're going to talk about what your talent is worth. Oh what's your my. talent worth, John? <laughs> at least a buck and a quarter. A buck and a quarter. What about you, Mary? Well, uh, I think the going rate's what fifty bucks for fifty bucks. <laughs> Matt, what about wow. you? I'm sorry, what? <laughs> <laughs> I know. 
<laughs> yeah, wait, wait, wait. Which, which talent are we talking about? Oh, yeah, exactly. Uh... I guess now we have something to talk about. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Okay. I suppose it depends on which talent we're tapping into. But. So it's uh, you know, we did a show a couple of years back, Dave. You'll remember it was me and you and Mike Lombardo and Stephen Cousins, mm-hmm. and we talked about should you ever give your work away for free. No. Um, <laughs> this this discussion uh, is basically a continuation mm-hmm. of that show. Yeah. Um. So, but you know, Lee and Shane and Elizabeth, they, you know, they they've got a wealth of knowledge sure. between the three yeah. of them and yeah, then, it's not me and Kozanuski and I'm there for, for laughs <laughs> um, but you know, no it, it's, a, it's a really good it's a really good discussion that sounds and, cool uh, we're, we're looking forward to, to well, like, what, what was that line that. in the Dark Knight that Joker said like don't do anything you do well for free or something yes. like that <laughs> oh okay here oh, we God. go see so you, you got it started if you're good at something never do it for free <laughs> that was good that was very good <laughs> Joker, it's, it's creepy it was really good it's creepy yeah the Joker needs to meet Alex Jones. Oh, God. <laughs> well, you think it's funny. <laughs> Makes fun of Alex Jones and Clockwork Elves. You know, you wouldn't have those scars if you'd had some silver wound gel in your corner. <laughs> <laughs> keep talking, keep shelling your vitamins, because uh, while you're doing that... I'm going to make that pencil disappear up your ass. <laughs> paying attention to you, they're not paying attention to what's going on over here. And, and that's where the real fun is. Oh, my God. This is the scariest thing ever. We've broken Dave. <laughs> He's got chemo brain. Hasn't even started the chemo yet. <laughs> Please. I've had chemo brain for the last four years. If you look at this fucking show, you should know that. My brain is a horror. I'm an idiot. All right, folks. We will see you next week. Bye, everybody. Bye. Hello. Is anybody out there? Anybody. This is Jim Cobb. If you're hearing this, the worst has happened. I've recorded a podcast at the end of the world and we're broadcasted on channel PEN every Friday. It's all about the apocalypse. Books, movies, TV, how much food and water will you need your bunker, all that kind of stuff. Excuse me, sir. You're going to have to keep the noise down. You're in a library and you're scaring the kids. The world hasn't ended yet. Sorry, ma'am. Shh. You're in the library at the end of the world with host Jim Cobb. Fridays exclusively on Project Entertainment Network.